And interestingly, if you then speak to the doctors and nurses who have resuscitated the people back to life, they have confirmed the reports. And what these people have said are often very specific details of what had happened to them during their own resuscitation. So for example, Dr. Smith walked into the room and as he saw me, he started screaming and he went round the bed and he knocked a bucket full of instruments onto the ground and I saw everything. And then he started pressing on my chest and shocking my heart, but I was very comfortable. I wasn't sure why he was doing all these things and, and reports like that. So the big question that comes about is can human mind and consciousness continue when we've reached the point of death and where all studies have shown the brain stops functioning? And that is one of the things that we'd like to address as part of the AWARE study. So before I actually announce the study itself, I'd also like to point out that studies carried out by independent researchers, both in humans and animals, have also shown that, as you'd expect, because there's no blood flowing into the brain during a cardiac arrest, during clinical death, that brain function ceases and that we can no longer measure any electrical activity within the brain. And this has raised a huge paradox for us scientifically because we cannot explain why people can have consciousness and thought processes when there is a flat line in the brain during this time. And this is one of the things that we'd like to address as well. So to move on to the AWARE study itself, this is the world's first and largest multi-center study addressing the question of what happens when we die, looking at what happens both to the brain as well as the mind and consciousness during the early phase of death, which may be just a few seconds, but maybe up to over an hour. What we have done in the United Kingdom, uh, together with uh, centers here in the United States um, to perform this study. Uh, we've also completed an 18-month pilot phase of this study uh, at five centers in the United Kingdom uh, that has allowed us to really refine our methodology before we expand out to, to the centers in the U.S. Um, and, and beyond. One of the key features of this study, uh, which has never been done in a large scale before, um, is to try to test the validity or the potential validity of the claims that people have of being able to see and here during clinical death, during cardiac arrest. And the way that we do this is that we uh, pre-install the areas in hospitals such as the coronary care units um, or emergency rooms or intensive care units, areas where people are more critically ill and more likely to have a cardiac arrest with various images that are placed near the ceiling and are only visible from the ceiling if you're looking down. So just to illustrate this, if we take just this simple example, we have a little symbol on a piece of paper. And now if you look on the back, of course, there's nothing visible. And if we were to put this strategically at a position near the ceiling, then the only way that that could be seen is if you're looking down from the ceiling and from nowhere below. And the way that we've done this is that we've installed different images. We've already installed about 750 images and shelves across numerous sites in the United Kingdom and we're about to expand this out to the US as well. And the idea being that if we get two or 300 people who come back from clinical death and report that they had seen doctors and nurses working on them, will they be able to see the images that are uh, near the ceiling? Now, these images are much more complex. It may be, for example, a picture of a baby. It may be a picture of a pink dog. But realistically, it's something that they would not have known about beforehand. They couldn't have seen it on television. They couldn't have thought about it before, and it would be nothing that symbolizes a hospital. Now if all of that group at one extreme come back and don't report seeing these images, then that simply tells us that the current scientific theory that these um, experiences are nothing more than illusions, they're what we call a false memory, must be correct. Because if indeed, as they claim, they were at the ceiling, then there's no reason why they shouldn't see these pictures. If on the other hand, somehow, and this is something that uh, is very difficult to explain now scientifically, but we have to listen to what the patients say and we have to conduct the objective studies. If people do come back and they describe seeing these pictures, then of course that will revolutionize our current science and in particular neuroscience. And it will help us understand something more about the nature of the human mind and consciousness. The other ad additional step that we have uh, implemented as part of this study is to 
develop a system or work with somanetics who have produced a cerebral oximeter, a device that measures oxygen levels within the brain as a marker of uh, blood flowing into the brain. And the system they have is called Invo system. And we'd like to use this on individual patients who have gone through clinical death to actually be able to demonstrate whether brain activity was not present, as all the studies have shown, or whether, again, paradoxically, perhaps in a small proportion of people, there was some uh, brain activity that uh, we had not been aware of. So that's something that we'd also be able to address as part of this study. And therefore, we'll be able to correlate brain activity with patients' experiences and to see whether the human mind and consciousness could potentially work when there is no blood flow into the brain, which is something that our current neuroscience does not allow for. But without the appropriate studies, we cannot really uh, say whether it's possible or not.